Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, participants who have attended uh, the Zoom webinar this afternoon. We will start in three minutes and we thank you for your timely uh, attendance in this webinar. Thank you very much. Excellencies, distinguished moderators, speakers, guests, and participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Welcome to the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation Discussion Series 2021. This afternoon's session is taking up the theme, 20 years of Aceh peace process, 15 years after Helsinki, a reflection. My name is Kartika, and I am the Project Management Officer of the ASEAN IPR. This chapter of the discussion series aims to reflect on the peace process in Aceh, particularly on the mediation process, which involved many parties, and to reflect how far Aceh has changed, how successful or not the agreement has been, and what lessons learned other countries can learn from the Aceh process. Just a disclaimer, we realize that the title of the session is 20 years of Aceh peace process and 15 years after the Helsinki MOU, but actually it is more accurately 21 years of peace process and 16 years after the MOU. So there is a bit of an inaccuracy, you may think, but this is because we initially planned this theme to be taken up as one of our webinars for last year, but we were unable to do so. Uh, moreover, I would also like to mention that the ASEAN IPR through the ASEAN IPR Indonesia 
is undertaking a research project <clears throat> titled Aceh Peace Building and Post Tsunami Recovery, which will examine the role of post tsunami humanitarian assistance as well as its activities in speeding up the peace building process in Aceh. The result of this research will be compiled into a publication and a policy brief. The research project is currently in the inception phase and enjoys the support from the government of Japan. Before we begin today's discussion, please allow me to brief you on some housekeeping matters to ensure everybody's comfort in following the discussion. During the presentation from the speakers, we request attendees in Zoom who wish to pose a question to the speakers to use the Q&A box, while viewers on YouTube can write their question in the live chat box. Please follow the format of question as explained by the organizers. Please refrain from using the chat or message box function on both platforms for personal or extensive discussions. We ask all participants to be polite and considerate in your messages. Thank you for respecting these house rules. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to introduce our moderator, Professor Miriam Coronel Ferrer. Professor Ferrer is a professor of politics at the University of the Philippines. She was the only Asian when she joined in the nine member United Nations standby team of mediators from 2018 to 2020. In this capacity, she undertook assignments in countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, and Maldives. Previously, she headed the government panel that negotiated and signed the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsa Moro with the Islam Moro Islamic Liberation Front on 27 March 2014. As the signatory chair of the government panel, Professor Ferrer became the first woman in the world to be chief signatory to a major peace agreement with an armed opposition group. She continued to oversee the agreement's implementation until the end of the term of the late President Benigno Simeon Aquino III in June 2016. In 2015, she received the Hillary Rodham Clinton Award for Advancing Women in Peace and Security. Without further ado, Professor, I now hand over the discussion to you. Thank you. Terima kasih, um, Kartika. Uh, Salamat siang, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, our executive director of uh, the, the AIPR, Ambassador Rusty Pudja, uh, the other members of the ASEAN uh, Governing Council, the ASEAN Women's Peace and uh, Peace Registry, so I hope uh, will have also joined us today. Fellow, uh, fellow students and practitioners of peace, I am very happy to be with you today. Easier, perhaps, to say, uh, to peg, um, and easier to get consensus exactly when peace talks started. But it's harder to determine when it, the process is actually ended. Um, that kind of consensus actually requires a lot of discussion and debate. And indeed, it's very, very difficult to see exactly when you will say that the process has been, has been successful or not, has been fully implemented or not. There will be, or there will always be questions. And that precisely is what we'll be looking at today. How far have we gone? Uh, what remains to be done? What have been the challenges uh, that brought us here? Uh, uh, 21 years after the signing of the peace agreement, the memorandum of understanding between the government of Indonesia and the GAM. By all indicators, however, we may say that comparatively speaking, the ACHA process was rather quick both in terms of the, uh, the time that it took to complete an agreement. I mean, just compared to the MLF, it took about 17 years to finish our, our agreement with them. And starting from either 1999 or 2000, just about five to six years to come up with the agreement. And very shortly, we saw key elements immediately implemented from the signing, uh, the passage of the law, the elections, we, uh, short, just a few years. And again, compare that to MILF, it took four years to pass the law, and it's still in a transition phase where elections are not just about to happen yet. But indeed, there is something common about both processes, and that's what we would certainly find in this discussion today, the fact that both processes have, have continued to you know, be on track, that there has been no major 
return to hostilities, despite the fact that there may have been uh, deviations from between the agreement and the law. And, um, and a lot of elements continue to be unimplemented. What these elements are, where how to move this forward, whether on the elements relating especially to security issues that remain very, very um, common, horizontal and vertical conflicts that, um, particularly the horizontal conflicts that remain, transitional justice and economic reintegration. This will be the uh, elements that we'll be looking at and hopefully our speakers will um, be here for us to enlighten us and, um, and give us a kind of a very good, clear picture of where we are. To start of our discussion, uh, we now welcome our first speaker for today, um, quite a well-known um, person from Indonesia, both as somebody who has easily tra struggled track two and track one, you know, of uh, international uh, um, diplomacy, how, what we call track one and track two international diplomacy. And then this is none other than um, Dr. Lisa Sukma, who was a senior, who is still a senior research fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Jakarta. And previously, its director until 2015. Afterwards, Dr. Sukma became ambassador of Indonesia to the United Kingdom, where in fact, he did his PhD years before at the London School of Economics. Um, also um, also uh, sat in the International Maritime Organization. Um, he, Dr. Sukma is very much involved in several other initiatives. He sits in the Muhammadiyah, he sat in the Muhammadiyah Central Executive Board and served as a member of uh, committees, gov Indonesian government committees, plotting the strategic defense um, bill for Indonesia earlier, as well as the armed forces bill. He was the first Indonesian to receive the Nakasone Award and named won 100 global thinkers in 2009 by foreign policy. Among the many books that Dr. Sukma has written is one on Aceh, and Dr. Sukma actually hails from Aceh, and that book is called Security Operations in Aceh, Goals, Consequences, and Lessons, published in 2004. I'm sure there is more to say beyond the 20 minutes that have been allotted for you, Dr. Sukma, so Please, let's not take, take any more of that time. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much, you know, Professor uh, Miriam Ferrer. It's great you know, to see you again after such a long time. And uh, let me first, you know, of course, uh, 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 thanks Ambassador Puja, you know, who kindly invited me to uh, share, you know, my, my thought, you know, on this, I think, important uh, occasion you know, to reflect on the uh, Aceh peace process and also on the uh, uh, political settlement, you know, between uh, the government of Indonesia and the Free Aceh movement uh, 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 that, that created peace, you know, in, in, in Aceh. And in fact, you know, I think we all agree that, you know, this is one of the few uh, successful cases, you know, of uh, negotiated political settlement, you know, to a secessionist, you know, conflict, you know, because we all know that, you know, it's a very difficult, really, you know, to uh, uh, find a solution to any uh, secessionist uh, conflict uh, in, in many parts of the world. Uh, I will try to, you know, to describe it very briefly or to respond to a number of questions that have been posed you know, to me by the organizer uh, uh, that uh, actually uh, give a, a picture not only where we are now, but also uh, the, on, 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 on where we were before, why you know, uh, some initiative failed and why some uh, the final initiative you know succeeded, and then what are the challenges that uh, we face you know in order to sustain that peace uh, uh, in 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 Aceh? Uh, of course, you know in 1998 Indonesia was you know under during I mean the tremendous uh, uh, changes you know and fundamental change you know, politically. So with you know General Suharto resigned uh, from power, then you know with the East Timor uh, referendum and so on, it really galvanized the demand for independence in Aceh, especially among the uh, Free Aceh movement or, or, or GAM. And then, you know, since then on, uh, we uh, uh, become very worried, you know, to look at the numbers of casualties, the level of violence that, you know, started to take place in, 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 the, in the province. 
But after President Wahid uh, became, you know, the pres Abdul Rahman Wahid became the president, and I think at that time, uh, the Henry Durang Center, you know, begin to, you know, uh, have a discussion with the, the president on how, you know, we can try to find a peaceful ways, you know, to really address that problem. If I'm not mistaken, that sometime in September, Shini uh, Yasheni will we'll probably clarify that later on. Uh, in uh, September 1999, uh, that's discussion then, you know, of course, led to a number of contacts, you know, uh, between the representative for Indonesia's government with, with the GUM. And the initiative, you know, actually uh, was taken by uh, Ambassador Hassan Wirayuda at that time was in, in Geneva uh, uh, to, 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 to try to contact, you know, the, the GUM uh, leaderships and, and then try to, 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 to have, you know, a, a discussion. Uh, so that's, you know, process actually uh, led to the agreement called Jeddah Kemanusiaan or Humanitarian Force. You know, I think that's the first, you know, agreement between GUM and you know, such government on how, you know, uh, we can actually stop the uh, violence. But unfortunately, of course, the Jeddah Komorsia didn't last very long. And then, you know, it, it collapsed, you know, very soon. But it started to, uh, I mean, it led to a second round of uh, discussion, uh, which is, you know, uh, culminated in the agreement on the cessation of hostilities agreement, the COHA, you know, in, I think, December 2002. You know, between the you know, government and uh, uh, the, the you know uh, uh, gum, and this is also not you know lasted very long. You know, it, it collapsed, I think, uh, in in two thousand three, uh, and and I remember at that time you know I had a lot of discussion with uh, David Gorman and also a few others you know at the Henry Durand Center, you know, in order to 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 try to understand you know how to make it really, really work. But unfortunately, uh, it 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 really you know collapsed uh, in two thousand three. You know, I think it's, it's very you know, interesting to look at now, what are the causes, you know, of that, you know, collapse? You know, this is my personal view. You know, I think because at that time, the two initiatives, the humanitarian force and the uh, COHA, uh, really focus only on the cessation of hostilities. So it's really actually about the ceasefire. So it doesn't really come up with, you know, a, a, a comprehensive framework to try to solve the problem, you know, in entirety. You know, it is is not really meant, you know, to 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 solve all the problems uh, between the government of Indonesia and uh, GAM. You know, especially it did not address the key issue, which is the demand for independence, you know, by 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 the free Aceh, uh, you know, free free Aceh movement. And that's, you know, I think it's really uh, 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 provided, you know, a very uh, a shaky uh, foundation, you know, for uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, agreement, you know, to. You know, you know, you know, to last. So that's, you know, I think the two uh, first attempt uh, to, to, to find a political settlement uh, to the problem, you know, between the United government and the uh, GAM. The second question is like, you know, what are the difficulties, you know, all the challenges uh, uh, that uh, parties, you know, face during the, the, the peace process, during the mediation uh, process? Uh, because, you know, before the Helsinki Peace Accord, I think it's quite clear, there was no domestic support whatsoever for the peace process beyond the personal guarantee or personal uh, 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 determination to find peace by President Abdurrahman Wahid. But you know, you know, lack of domestic support from across the board, across Indonesia, really critical, you know, in, in I think making this uh, agreement uh, uh, is a failure, you know, because the civil, I mean, even the, 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 the civilians, uh, are not really, you know, on board, you know, to, to support any negotiation, any discussion between the government of Indonesia and the rebels, you know, the separatist uh, group in, 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 in Aceh. Number two, you know, I think the absence of trust is very clear. You know, the government of Indonesia did not trust GAM. GAM, of course, you know, did not trust the government of Indonesia. They also didn't trust, you know, the, uh, the, the military at, at the time. And the absence of trust was well reflected in the fact that you know before the the, the koha was, was signed uh, the, the the gum negotiators uh, at that time you know who wanted to fly to tokyo for another round of talk they all get arrested in in, in banda aceh you know of course it really undermined you know the 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 the, 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 the process you know, because uh, uh, trust was not restored and in fact was undermined uh, uh, further and it is also at the time no one actually 
came up with the uh, solution to the most difficult problem. You know, how you reconcile the demand for independence on in one hand, and then, you know, the insistence of the insurance government to uh, stick to the unitary form of Republic of Indonesia, and then <clears throat> to uh, the, uh, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to deny, you know, any uh, 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 proposal for referendum like what happened in, 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 in East Timor uh, earlier. So these are difficult points, you know, uh, uh, between the government and, and the GAM, which of course, you know, uh, uh, could not lead to any meaningful, meaningful uh, uh, agreement. Then the tsunami came, you know, in, in December. But we knew now that even before tsunami, we, with the new government and the President Yudhoyono and the Vice President Sukala at the time, some form of talks you know, already started, you know, between Pa uh, Yusuf Kala and some uh, 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 contacts you know, within the uh, 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 GAM. So, did the tsunami really affect the peace process? You know, and and if so, in in, in what ways? Uh, I would argue that you know, not directly, you know, because tsunami also affected Sri Lanka, but you know, it didn't lead to a political you know settlement uh, of the problem, you know, over there. Uh, but it did, you know, in, in Aceh. So it's not directly. What is, is important to recognize at the time after the tsunami is really pushed the key actors in the conflict, the GAM and the military aside, you know, and then suddenly there is this huge vacuum in the middle, you know, created by the tsunami, what I call the humanitarian, you know, uh, vacuum. So, you know, in fact, the tsunami created the most powerful humanitarian context, you know, for peace talk to resume. You know, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, there, there is almost non-existence domestic support, you know, for any talks with the uh, rebels. But, you know, after the tsunami, it would be difficult for anybody, you know, to oppose any attempt to find a peaceful solution to create peace after 300,000 people perish, you know, in the uh, tsunami. So it really created that, you know, humanitarian momentum, humanitarian context, you know, for peace talk, you know, to, to resume. And in fact, nobody opposed, you know, to uh, uh, peace talk, you know, to, to, to restart again uh, after, after, uh, after the uh, tsunami. Number two, and also there is this need, you know, to create a more peaceful environment if Aceh really want to, you know, uh, uh, rebuild itself after the tsunami and the international attentions you know, to Aceh at the time make it harder for the hawk you know, in the government to oppose you know, any uh, peace uh, talks in between the government and the, uh, the uh, uh, GAM. So these are, I think, the, 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 the indirect uh, uh, impact you know, uh, of, of the tsunami on, on peace uh, uh, process. And so how did then these uh, uh, peace actors manage you know, the post-tsunami reconstruction efforts and peace building uh, efforts on the other. So I think I need to really emphasize a number of points, which is very important to understand why the Helsinki Peace Accord, you know, survived, succeeded. And in fact, I would argue that, you know, now it's very difficult to even imagine that Aceh would go back to the uh, secessionist conflict again. So Aceh has passed this eight years or 10 years test, if you like, you know, once a conflict, you know, a solution passed that 10 years, and then it would be very difficult, you know, to reverse the process. So there are a number of, you know, factors for that. Number one, third party mediation is very, very critical, very, very important. You know, when two sides you know, in the conflict do not trust each other, then the third party, impartial, you know, party uh, uh, involvement and help in the mediation is critical. And Aceh really demonstrated that. The involvement of third party has not undermined Indonesia's sovereignty. In fact, it enhanced that sovereignty by helping you know, to facilitate this uh, 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 peaceful uh, agreement between the government and uh, GAM uh, in, 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 in Aceh. Number two, I think the credibility of the third party is also you know, equally important. You know, and then both sides, the Indonesia's government, GAM, at that time, you know, they both actually trusted the uh, third party, you know, which is the uh, CMI you know, from, from Helsinki. So at that time, uh, uh, the Indonesian government, you know, entered into this uh, political uh, talk with GAM facilitated by CMI and which led to the uh, MOU, what, what they call it in Aceh, 
you know, Helsinki MOU. The third, you know, I think factor, the agreement is quite comprehensive. It really covers almost everything. You know, it really does, you know, actually, you know, uh, uh, present a package of, you know, agreement. It deals with DDR, you know, the, on the disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. It also, you know, deals with the status of Aceh within the uh, Unitary Republic of Indonesia. It also deals with the problem of, of legal issues, political participation, human rights, reconciliation, and, and so on. So I think this is quite, you know, I think critical and important for any peace agreement uh, if, you know, it want to, to succeed. So it really address all the key concerns of, of uh, uh, parties involved. Otherwise, you know, piecemeal approach uh, is be, it will be difficult. But let me close by saying that the two previous attempts is very important in the sense that it really opened up the possibility for negotiated political settlement. So because of the COHA and the humanitarian post before that facilitated by the Union Center, so the Indonesian public do not really see any uh, the, the, the peace talk as uh, something taboo anymore. So it opened up the possibility for the government and the rebels in Aceh, you know, to talk, you know, because it was really uh, considered taboo in the past, but, you know, because of the humanitarian post and then the Koha, and then it would you know, actually make it easier for the government, you know, to enter into the Helsinki uh, peace talk, which led, you know, to the uh, process uh, to the uh, agreement uh, between uh, uh, the two sides. Very briefly on the fifth point, you know, how has the Aceh peace process changed the policy of government of Indonesia in their approach to other solutions of conflict in the country? I would say no effect. You know? So Aceh has been quite unique. I can't see, I know where this you know, question leads. I can't see any possibility that Indonesia's government at this moment would adopt a similar approach in dealing with the secessionist movement in Papua. Thank you so much. You are on mute. You are still on mute. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Sukma. I think you still have a few minutes left, and I don't know if you wish to add a few more points on both items number four and five in the questions that have been provided to you. To what extent is not affected, as you said, the, um, the response of government to other similar conflicts. And of course, there was East Timor before, and we so, did see a little, uh, quite a big difference in, in the response. And uh, again, moving forward, uh, how do we see now the post-tsunami construction efforts uh, sort of interlinking with the peace building efforts um, uh, post-agreement? We still have about five minutes to do this. Okay, uh, I will just you know add a few things. Number one, you know, looking back, you know, to the why why this Helsinki peace accord succeeded. So I think two factors that I forgot to mention, uh, additional factors. Number one, is of course, the role of AMM, you know, the uh, Aceh monitoring mission, you know, uh, uh, organized by the EU. So that's I think is quite critical, you know, because. Both the government of Indonesia and the GAM really trusted, you know, the mechanism and, and also uh, the work, you know, of the uh, Aceh monitoring mission at the time, especially, you know, on the question of demobilization and then disarmament. Yeah. So these are two uh, critical issues that I think the MM, you know, uh, managed, you know, to uh, implement, you know, uh, really uh, well. Number two, there is this commitment and also firm, you know, central government's attitude. You know, under President Yudhoyono. President Yudhoyono and Vice President Yusuf Kala at the time were very, very firm that this peace process and peace you know, must be established in Aceh, especially to make it possible for the international community together with the Indonesian government to really you know, uh, uh, undertake this post-tsunami uh, uh, reconstructions. Now, you know, after 16 years, uh, with the establishment of the political parties in Aceh with the uh, no, two or three times election already. So I think Aceh has been normalized, you know, quote unquote, if you like. This is not very nice, actually, to be normalized. Now we face exactly the same problem in Aceh with any problem in any other provinces, you know, the question of money politics, 
to questions of capacity of the local government to deliver you know, its promises of the election. So in that context, you know, Aceh has more or less become similar. And I mean, the challenges that they face also, you know, similar to any other province in, in Indonesia. Uh, but again, my, you know, uh, word of caution is that this aspiration for independence, even though at the moment, we haven't heard anything yet about this, but, you know, it might still be there. So in that context, peace building need to be continuously nurtured. You know, if we really want you know, to actually uh, 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 bury this, you know, a dream of being an independent state in, in Aceh. Uh, and number two, it's really up to the Achenes themselves at the moment, you know, especially uh, now they already have this almost like federal-like uh, rights to really deliver on the economic you know, uh, front. So because now the Achenes can no longer you know, blame Jakarta for whatever you know, economic and social ill that they will uh, face at the moment and, and the future. But I'm quite confident that you know, it would be difficult now you know, to reverse the peace process in Aceh then I don't see any possibility that Aceh will go back to this, you know, a secessionist uh, problem, you know, again in the near future. Thank you very much for that. We'll uh, we'll have time to look into some more of the points raised by uh, Dr. Sukma. But for now, we are ready to listen to the next speaker. Uh, this time from um, the uh, a member uh, from the organization that actually facilitated the talks and was very much part of uh, not only the implementation in the initial years, but also follow through in subsequent years through its different projects. And that's on the, not none other than the CMI, uh, Conflict Management Institute, the Marty Asiari Peace Foundation. And we have with us here today, uh, Madam Mina Kukonen Karlander, Senior Manager of the Asian Program of the Asia Program at CMI, um, which was established in 2019, um, stemming from earlier engagements precisely in the region, notably in uh, in Indonesia. Mr. Ms. Kukonen Karlander has previously worked as an advisor to President Atisari including serving as the acting head of office of uh, the president. Uh, prior to joining the office, Ms. Kukonen Karlander has served as project manager and advisor to several CMI's mediation-related activities in Africa and um, in Southeast Asia. So uh, that will be great to see also some have comparative insights between what uh, you have seen here in our region as well as in uh, Africa, which has its many conflicts as well. She has over 10 years of experience in peace mediation and conflict resolution in various capacities. Um, Ms. Kokonen Karlander holds a Master's of Law Law's degree from Uppsala University with specialization in public international law. Please, uh, Mina, please, uh, we're eager to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Are you able to hear me? I see that I was muted in the beginning. Thank you. I take this yes. And, and thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. It's so honored to be here. Thank you to the ASEAN IPR and, and to um, the Executive Director Puja uh, and also fellow panelists. It's a wonderful opportunity to be here speaking with you today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, nice to address this wider audience too. And I'm happy to be able to join with you and share some of the CMI's experience in conflict resolution and mediation. And, and like the, the previous speaker, try to answer some of those questions uh, posed to me uh, in advance by the ASEAN IPR. Uh, and I try to address them in a, in a in this in this talk in, in, that I'm going to have, but maybe for those of you that don't know, um, CMI, the Marti Atasari Peace Foundation, it is an independent uh, Finnish organization that works to prevent and resolve conflicts uh, through mediation and dialogue. Uh, and as was stated, uh, it, it is founded in uh, year 2000 by the Nobel Peace Laureate and former president of Finland, Marti Atasari. 
uh, but the organization has since grown to one of the larger uh, independent uh, organizations in the field of peacemaking. So, so our work uh, expands to cover Middle East, uh, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Eurasia, and Asia. And uh, we focus on different thematic themes as, such as women in peacemaking and also lately you know, uh, digital peacemaking. So, uh, but of course the Aceh peace process, which we are discussing today uh, and the negotiations back in 2005 uh, have in many ways been a formative experience uh, also to us as CMI in, in our very early days. And I'm happy to reflect uh, that experience and, and uh, the lessons that we as a independent organization have, have drawn uh, from that process. Um, um, and and as, as the previous speaker eloquently covered many aspects of, of, of the process already, so I apologize for possible uh, repetition, uh, but just to say that um, as, as many of you are well aware and maybe have also been, as, as the panelists have personally been involved in the Archer process, I, I will not go into the depth of the entire process for the sake of time, but I will try to focus on what it is that could be a broader lesson or lessons uh, from mainly CMI's point of view uh, as an independent organization, but also touch upon the roles of international and regional organizations in, in a more general fashion. And like, like we know, each conflict is a unique with its own history, peoples and, and uh, elements, and therefore also the peace processes are unique and do not always very easily allow for, at least for easy comparisons. Uh, but however, there are elements that we can be, that can be learned uh, from them that can also be useful in, in other contexts, as has been said earlier this morning. And we, at least the CMI, have drawn many lessons from the ACHE process over the years, and I'm certain, <laughs> uh, happy to say that the process continues to inspire us also uh, in our work today, but also our counterparts and colleagues who are eager to learn from that experience. And, and uh, it is perhaps true to say that conflicts have become more complex and, and multifaceted with the multiplicity of actors and conflict parties and there are various interests in the power place. Uh, but I, uh, I would assume it's safe to say that it's uh, all the more evident than any peace process needs to be a group effort really, with uh, support from several sides. And, and also in the case of Archer, of course, while it was essentially uh, a conflict between two uh, parties, uh, international regional organizations, as well as several non-state actors, and, and of course, individual states played many roles in supporting the process. And the Aceh Peace Agreement, the Memorandum of Understanding of the MOU, as it's been called, uh, and its implementation would not have been possible without the combined efforts of many different actors. Of course, the uh, parties and the Indonesian government, and, uh, but also the EU and the ASEAN and other supporting governments, uh, local civil society, many research organizations, and, and, and many international NGOs whose expertise and analysis CMI used um, on several occasions. I know I was not personally involved in the negotiations, but I've been a close aide to President Ahtisari and, and have many times spoken of this uh, and with colleagues who were personally involved in the process. And I, I would say that uh, in particular these um, or in the CMI view, the, the independent organizations were very, very helpful in creating also forums where some of the uh, more sensitive discussions could take place uh, on, on a different side from the, the, the main negotiations, so to say. So, um, as was stated earlier, President Marti Atzarian and uh, his non governmental organization CMI received the mandate to support the ACHE peace negotiations in early 2005 uh, from the core conflict parties themselves, the Indonesian government approached uh, CMI. This was just after the tsunami. And uh, the earlier mediation efforts, in particular by those of the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, uh, proved, as was said by, by Dr. Dr. Sukma here, very useful in having tested the ground and the process. So it was a new, not a new setup in that sense for, for the parties. Uh, so when the government uh, 
of Indonesia requested CMI's uh, help um, in facilitating the discussions with the Aceh Free Movement GUM uh, to end the 30 year war. Um, President Ahtisari and CMI had a quite clear view uh, from, from CMI's point of view how the mediation process could be made effective. And, and it did need the commitment of both parties to the process, of course, uh, but had to have also a realistic end result, have, have a clear timeline. Some of these issues were highlighted by, by the previous speaker as well. But uh, President Atisari was very keen on also um, uh, making firm that the negotiations were not uh, draw out in time extensively, but that there would be, it would be a fairly short process. So there were five different rounds of negotiations in Helsinki, Finland, between January and August 2005. Uh, and in August 15, 2005, the agreement was signed uh, based on the willingness of the parties to find a solution with dignity for all, as, as it was said. And in terms of the process itself, uh, for an organization like us, many of the lessons used uh, or learned in that process have been useful uh, and, and still, uh, <laughs> so to say, things that we consider uh, in our work, I would say almost daily. Some of these are the timing of the mediation, when is a conflict right, as, as, as was uh, described by uh, Dr. Sukma here before, when is the conflict right for, for a mediation process when other party is ready, what are the methods of mediation, uh, President Tahtasar and CMI had this principle of nothing is agreed before everything is agreed. Uh, so, in a way, the whole result, in a way, could be um, considered as a package and there would be no, so to say, partial wins or so. And so, it, it, it would be a package, so to say. How to create a conducive atmosphere, whether it should be public or private mediation, uh, which is suitable in, in which context. How to sequence and structure the talks. Uh, what are the parameters of the discussion? What role does the mediator have? Um, what kind of leadership is there from both sides? And, and what is the mandate of those parties to make decisions? Um, of course, very important, as was um, mentioned here is the, the leverage. Uh, is there political support to the process? And, and in this case, uh, uh, as was said by Dr. Sukma, there really was this momentum and, and willingness of, of the parties and the Indonesian government to settle the issue. Um, of course, the importance of networks that the mediation mediator has uh, and, and who are willing, which parties and which uh, organizations uh, are willing to support the process. Uh, but also very important in our work is the importance of the party's ownership of the process and the local ownership. Uh, you cannot force an agreement on a parties if they're not willing to agree. And this is really a key in, in, in all our work. Um, also, we consider it important to have a roadmap uh, with deadlines that are accepted by the parties. So there is a plan, so to say, a process uh, to guide the discussion. Uh, in terms of Ache, also uh, the, the fairly maybe new novel challenge at the time was how to combine the private peacemaking sphere with governments and regional actors uh, and how that all uh, functions in, in, a, in a unison. Uh, and how is the agreement? Uh, as was mentioned, uh, the MOU is a very concise agreement uh, with uh, Quite a lot of detail as, as pertains to, to the uh, different elements that were mentioned by Dr. Um, Dr. Sukma here before, but the implementation really uh, of it was left to the parties. And very importantly, as was mentioned already as well, the role of monitoring, uh, which was critical. And, and already at the outset of those discussions, President Ahtisari and CMI team. I uh, thought it was important uh, not to focus on a ceasefire agreements, but to aim for a clear end state and a permanent solution to the conflict that would guarantee uh, the peace in the society. And uh, the issue of monitoring uh, of the process was considered, I think, already um, uh, during the first round of negotiations in Helsinki. Um, 
mm, lesson learned perhaps was that if the monitoring part of the process is not uh, professionally and efficiently planned and implemented, uh, so the pro then the prospects for a sustainable peace would not be as strong. And uh, it seemed important also that the monitoring, mi monitoring mission would need to combine actors from governments and regional organization and the civil society, and that it would include both civil and military expertise. Uh, and it was, I think, quite early clear that uh, any traditional UN peacekeeping operation would not be an option. Uh, so both parties considered the regional organizations as acceptable and um, agreed to this role also to the role of EU in this more technical sense. So, so the ACHE monitoring mission, AMM, was jointly deployed by the ASEAN contributing state. Uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines, and Singapore, and the European Union. And uh, deployment, I think, in particular from the five uh, ASEAN countries, increased the credibility and acceptability of the operation and were critical in terms of its success. Um, so the AMM then came to include uh, regional intergovernmental actors, military and civil society actors. Uh, so it was a combination and it was deployed on uh, the 15th of September 2005, so quite directly after the negotiations were finalized. And, and uh, uh, the, the aim or the task was to monitor really the implementation of the various aspects of the peace agreement as set out in the MOU. So it included decommissioning and destruction of weapons monitoring and relocation of non-organic military forces, monitoring the reintegration of uh, gun members into society, but also monitoring the human rights situation and, and the legislative change. So, so to the law and governance of Ache, that implementation, so to say. Um, and uh, it was really, I think, in terms of lessons learned, uh, the mission was instrumental in maintaining the peace in the early months following the peace agreement and also uh, as an operation offers an in, in interesting insight into the role of regional actors and, and, and their collaboration with one another in, in order to support the really a national process. Um, uh, so, um, as, as a mediation, peace mediation and conflict resolution organization, it is, of course, important uh, to know when to leave the process, uh, as the process is essentially um, uh, responsibility of the parties uh, themselves uh, to own and implement the process. And uh, I think it was mentioned here by our moderator also to, that CMI has been following the situation uh, since then. And indeed, in, in between 2010 and 2000. Uh, 12, um, um, CMI initiated the Ache Peace Process Follow Up Project uh, to very much based on the fact that some issues remain contested between the parties uh, of the peace agreement. And um, we hope to support the process for implementing the outstanding issues of the Helsinki Peace Agreement. So during the course of those two years, the CMI, CMI team worked with stakeholders both in Ache and Jakarta in order to clarify the status of, of implementation uh, or unimplemented implementation, uh, as well as the views of the parties and stakeholders regarding this issue. Um, uh, and uh, of course, it was not possible and or helpful really to, to scrutinize every single aspect of the un unimplemented provisions of the MOU. Uh, CMI aimed at defining the main issues and questions at stake in close cooperation with the signatories. And um, then there was a, so to say, established a, a negotiation or discussion platform for the parties to negotiate on how to best implement those open issues. But since then, uh, since the end of the 2012, CMI has not really actively been engaged in Ache and conti we continue to monitor the situation from a more distance. Uh, uh, and. Uh, Yes, I, I, I think it's, it, as, as the previous speaker was saying, that the Archer process has really been a success in many respects due to the local ownership and commitment by the Indonesian parties. And I think this is a key lesson for its success. Uh, maybe the 
should I have the time, uh, I maybe like to say a few words, uh, or I don't maybe. <laughs> How am I doing that? Yeah, four minutes. minutes. Four, four minutes. minutes. Thank four you. Minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, on on the role of um, uh, women uh, in the archer process uh, that has been a uh, key concern to us too. Um, and, and despite the important role of advocating for peace and fostering reconciliation in the Achenese society during the years of the conflict, the Achenese women really had a limited role in my understanding in terms of the dialogue process uh, overall. And, and, and uh, up until the signing of the MOU in August 2005. And while there are or were already at place um, the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 that stressed the importance of women's roles uh, and the need for women's equal participation in, in promotion and maintenance of peace and security, uh, the framework was still, well, the framework was partly there now, uh, I think it's fair to say that only in recent times we have seen the political support for this issue increasing. And uh, it can also be said that another lesson for us as CMI from the ACHE process uh, has been to actively promote this team. Uh, for example, we have, um, uh, we are co-convener of a UN high level seminar on gender and inclusive mediation strategies. And it, it is really uh, women's role and, and, and uh, gender in peace processes is really a strategic priority for our work. Uh, starting from uh, indeed the Ache, Ache experience. So we are in this respect pleased to have seen the regional networks of women peace mediators uh, developing uh, also, uh, of course, in the ASEAN context and, and giving uh, this visibility to the expert, exp expertise and experience that women do have in peace mediation. And I, it's, it's our firm commitment that women are needed in this work in many levels, and I, I think the Achenese uh, women, of course, are case in point in this this sense um, with their with their prominent role in the Achenese society uh, and and the work that they have been doing. So maybe I stop here and uh, wait for your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mina. I'm sure we will still have some time afterwards. Uh, to explore some of these items, uh, including women's participation before, during, and after. And we do have one question on women already in the Q&A box that we'll get back to soon enough. Uh, so for now, uh, we're ready to hear our third panelist, uh, last but not least, and uh, more on what's been going on lately uh, from um, uh, Shani. Shani, yep. did I pronounce that right? Shani yes. Angelina, the country representative of Indonesia of, of in, for the HD Humanitarian Dialogue, of which, of course, was uh, the first third party mediator involved in the earlier process, the process that led to human, humanitarian pause. And today they are still very, very active, as we can see from um, uh, or hear later. Uh, from Shani, who joined HD in 2002 to assist the organization with its operation in Aceh, Indonesia, and later on, but left for a while, went to Iraq uh, with the International uh, Relief and Development Office in Iraq for a year, and returned in 2004 before uh, the uh, peace agreement was signed. And Shani has been working there ever since. Um, uh, Shani has also been involved in other HD-related activities in Asia, in East Timor, uh, Timor-Leste from 2007-2009, as well as on issues related to other parts of Indonesia since 2008. And I hope we can get back to the question about, you know, how does the, how has or how can the ACHA process inform uh, government perspectives in relation to all of these other <coughs> unfinished uh, issues. Um, Shani specialized on a number of substantive themes, as well as on process-related questions in her work with numerous government and non-government partners. So, Shani, please, uh, we are ready to listen to you. Thank you, Professor Miriam. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Puja and IBR for inviting me to be part of this discussion. This is just like bring it back memory after 20 years 
working in Aceh. I think many of you, uh, we call our organization now Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, but many of Achenese in Indonesia know one as uh, Cent uh, Henry Dunan Center. Uh, PhD start the uh, PhD is like private uh, diplomacy organization in Swiss. This in Swiss will mediate between government, non-state armed groups, and opposition party to reduce conflict, limit the human suffering caused by the war, and develop an opportunity for peaceful settlement. HD was established in 1999. Soon after, not long after we established, we start our uh, first uh, initiative uh, mediation uh, program, program in Aceh. We went to Aceh, as pa Rizal mentioned before, on September 99, uh, as our uh, first assessment was we was invited by late uh, President Abu Ahmad Wahid to look into Aceh and um, Using as principle of new prevention as a guideline, HD initial aim in Indonesia is to prevent the humanitarian crisis that occurring in Aceh through the uh, reduction of violence. HD also uh, prefer means of obtaining the objective was through mediating dialogue between the representative of government of Indonesia and GAM. We believe that through the dialogue, violence will decrease and result a humanitarian uh, crisis will be uh, averted. Throughout the process, um, we start to also, we in early 2000, it was the first meeting between the government of Indonesia and GAM. And uh, from that, the, 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 the process was developed and we have the first sign of agreement, which is joint understanding of humanitarian powers, uh, as Paris also mentioned before, on the 12th of May, 2000 uh, for Aceh. This process was not long, then it was, uh, uh, was stopped due to so many reasons. But then we pick up again on the 9th of December, 2002, the COHA was signed. COHA agreement was processed. We do a lot of uh, uh, work on the ground with the government of Indonesia and GAM, and then it will lead to the Tokyo meeting and as mentioned before the Tokyo meeting, uh, before leave to the meeting, representative from GAM was arrested in Aceh. And the talk, uh, because of the lack of the trust, the talk in Tokyo was uh, break down. And at the time, government of Indonesia uh, uh, imposed the martial law in Aceh. I believe that this process was uh, solved because as we hear from two of our panelists, one, if the both party was there is no trust, nothing will move forward. There is also a political will. Political will is important, play an important role on the peace process. Um, and HG still work, HG still work in the Aceh, even though after the peace process broke down on the 2004, uh, 2003, but we was keeping in touch with Aceh, uh, GAM and Indonesian government because we believe that there is always a momentum to continue the peace process. There is, there will be another window of opportunity to start the process, no matter what. So, and that's what happened in 2004 after tsunami when CMI come and continue the process. So I believe that lesson learned from this process of uh, peace process, you can't, when the peace process fails, you can't just give up. You are always trying to continue and trying to build a momentum, build a contact with the both sides to see that there is another window opportunity to start. Uh, there is a question from the organizer about uh, what uh, achieved and what not being achieved throughout the process after the Helsinki uh, process. I think there is, I define it as three big achievements on the, after, the, after the Helsinki agreement. One of them is not return to violence, the true and reconciliation and political transition. No return to violence, this is, has not been, uh, uh, there is no has been uh, return to violence. That, that means the reintegration process was, uh, of, of the combatant was a very important part of the process and it was successful. We don't see any big violence as prior uh, as before. And this is also lead to the political transition because as you can see that 
you know, after the Helsinki process, the GAM has established their own political party and they have actually been part of the governor of the Aceh. And this is, this is good. There is no violence political competition in Aceh. While there is led to the factionalism, but this is, is common in other parts of Indonesia. So I will consider this as one of the successful story, a, three, a big achievement from the process, from the MOU. The other one was true and reconciliation. True and reconciliation program did allow people to deal with the past. There are still obstacles, such as like there is still not human, human right court, and there is a problem on the compensation and rehabilitation. And also when I talk to the, my colleague in Aceh, they all also complain about the human resource, capacity of the human resource to doing this uh, program and also the lack of funding. There is also about the support from the, not only from the local government, but also from the central government as is also an issue. So there is need of the talk to address this kind of issue, even though we say that it's a big achievement, but I think continue on the peace building and continue to make sure that everything running is, is important. As pa, I will refer again, Paris, I'll say before that maybe there is no talk about independence again, but you know, if you don't, you don't um, guide this process and peace building, then it will one day it will be break again. So we need to be more uh, serious about looking after this and how we're going to achieve uh, to make it that whatever uh, achievement we have is actually smooth and run. Uh, unfinished business. Uh, I, I also categorize there's many of them, but I will take it three unfinished business that I think is the major thing in Aceh. One of them is economic recovery. As we know that, as we know, after 20 after 16 years now of the Helsinki MOU, I think uh, economy, pro economy recovery in Aceh is not grown as fast as it, should, it could. This is, I think, is looking back, I think is because there is so many um, regulations uh, in central and uh, local uh, regulation that class. Giving you example, the investment is still hindered under overlapping uh, national and regional regulation. I think this is also need to be discussed more further between the government and open the opportunity to have more thorough discussion. Second one is, as everybody mentioned in this uh, panelist, about women empowerment. I think women under representative Aceh government uh, is still under uh, the court. I think this is not because their lack of talent. There's a lot of impressive women in Aceh. But I think it's still the paradigm of patriotic in Aceh is very strong. And under the Sharia law is also is, is, is not that benefit for the woman. So uh, how my question will be also that how we're gonna address this, how women can be finally be involved in politics under this Sharia law, how can they think, um, how can they be uh, more uh, uh, concern about women participation in Aceh. Um, the last thing on the unfinished business is the symbolic of Aceh. As we know that the flag of gum has been under the logo is it should be acknowledged as symbol of Aceh, but in practical, in reality, uh, this flag issue is still uh, a major thing. There is a different perspective about the flag in Jakarta and in Aceh. Achenese believe that this flag is a symbol of Aceh, while in Jakarta, there is still some belief that the flag is symbol of the AM group. So whenever uh, a lot of uh, people that I talk in Aceh say that whenever they raise the flag, they always being put it down the flag. So there is an issue that misunderstanding, misperspective that has to be addressed. And this is cannot just being leave it under the rider. Um, lesson learned from the process. How can we build on the success of the Aceh peace process? How can we learn from this process? As you mentioned, uh, as Ms. Mina mentioned before, each process, peace process is different. 
Uh, you can't copy and paste on doing the peace process from one process, but there is one or two things that you can learn from the process. One of the thing is arm group transfer, transformation. Uh, peace process is in, peace process involves a process of arm group turning to the political actor. And this is, you can see in Aceh is a very successful uh, lesson learned on allow the arm group to have the political party and to, to uh, and uh, to gov governor. Uh, this is also a long term, long term process. So this process is not just a matter of signing of the MOU. Okay? I think this is a process, the long process that have to build. And as before, also one of the panelists say that the peace process, you have to build the ground. Dialogue was taboo in Aceh when we started. Dialogue was not something that there is trauma of esteem or that people would not even want to talk about dialogue. The process of the ground, the humanitarian post, the koha, it was the process that people familiar that there is okay to sit down and talk. There might be obstacle to reach, but there is okay. There is no harm to sit down and talk. And I think this is what we should learn from the process. This process is also a teamwork. H3 uh, made considerable progress in Aceh. CMI mediate the final agreement. Uh, this is a, a, a process that whoever style, whoever finish, I think there's a teamwork of each one. And we also get support from ASEAN, from uh, European country, um, other, uh, World Bank and many others, uh, and also civil society play a big role. So without them, the priest process will not just there itself. Um, and also we have to prepare for unexpected. The 2004 tsunami was a terrible, terrible tragedy. However, it's also open space for resumption of peace negotiation political space. There might be not political will at the time when HG was working on it. And during the, after the tsunami, uh, uh, Pa Yusuf Kala and President Bambang Yudhoyono, both of them have the uh, really political will to solve the Aceh process. There's also a pressure from international community to, you know, to be able to give it a humanitarian access to, to Aceh, to rebuild Aceh. And then also pressure for the Indonesian government and GAM. And I think this is important uh, part. So there is also thing can change quickly, which make peace is possible. Uh, we should be constantly working with the conflict party and help them uh, to be ready before the window opportunity is arise. So peace process is nothing that one stop, one, uh, one uh, stop process, but it will be continue process that we need to continue, continue uh, involved in the process. Um, and then in Aceh, if today there's question about if today peace process happen in Aceh, uh, what will happen? I think today if the peace process happen in Aceh, I think we are be more ready. Yes, HD was working in Aceh before and involved the peacekeeper from Thailand and Filipino with ASEAN country. But today, I think ASEAN is more ready. They have the IAPR, which is the capacity building for party, which is can help on capacity building for party, mediator, and civil society. They also can deploy experts from IPR women, uh, peace registry. And they also can act as a knowledge uh, hub and help local actors to access the expertise. They also an uh, 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 AHA center, which is can coordinate between ASEAN country to humanitarian response, build on capacity of local humanitarian actor and deploy experts from the actor across the region. So today, I think we are more ready than before because when 20 years ago, you always think that this is never been possible. But today, with a lot of case, a lot of lesson learned, I think it's always possible for peace. So um, never give up. And my final question will be, when started working at uh, Aceh, I say the peace is not possible. So what conflict in the region currently seems impossible? That's maybe from me. I think I'm too quick. I still have a lot of time, Miriam. That's right. You still have five minutes. Would you like to go a little bit deeper on some of the questions here, like, um, how is, has the peace process appeased the different and opposing demands of stakeholders? 
uh, not so much perhaps during just the negotiation process, but especially now, uh, you'll be talk about factionalism and why to a certain extent this is, this is sort of normal. But at the same time, you have diverse stakeholders, demands that need to be addressed as well. So how is this being managed now? And um, you think the MOU should be revisited or is this the right approach uh, in uh, trying to come to terms with some of the continuing challenges? <laughs> Uh, not not so much repeat of the MU, but I think uh, you have to like you know I think the there is a lot of regulation under MOU and under LOGA that cannot be implemented because of the class with the uh, uh, central government regulation. So I think this is have to be another talk. Uh, different uh, different issue for example the flag i think that's 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 the most important thing that i think people should sit down and talk about it and make it the same perspective because this is also important for Achenis also about their flag woman participation is also like uh, so many people talking about women i think you can see a lot of women from Ache is now raise their concern about uh, woman participation and the stigma of this uh, patriarchy so I think uh, this is, yes, uh, not so much of, re re I think you just have to review on what has not been done and what can we do forward. I think the MOU itself as a packet is actually quite good MOU. Uh, the implementation, that's what they questioned. Uh, the stakeholder itself, I think, government, uh, a lot of things that when I'm talking to so many people in Aceh as well, when I, I, I discuss with them, they say that uh, Indonesian government has given to Aceh as a, what they call, uh, power to running their country and under special autonomy, uh, except the security sector. But in implementation, everything has to be asked from the central government. And it might be different perspective, but I think, um this is this is i think that one that uh we have to look into back into the process all right thank you uh thank you shani uh angelica for for that i think uh these are some of the issues that we will pursue when we get to the uh open forum. Um, so what we heard today is uh, 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 very complementary uh, presentations, focusing first on the different factors that have made the peace process uh, possible or how made peace possible um, uh, through the MOU that was forged in 2005 uh, from uh, Dr. Sukma Riza. We heard factors like uh, the bigger public support, uh, trust building, third part, the role of third party mediators, uh, and monitoring government, um, government uh, strategy, political will, and, and so on. And uh, from um, Mina, we saw it from the perspective of the facilitator, looking at the process, what we call the process design in the negotiations, highlighting in how, um, the, the factors that they had to take into account, the conducive environment that had to be there, the structuring of the talks, the parameters, the ro roadmap, and looking at implementation mechanisms uh, beyond the, the, the substance, uh, the main uh, substantive components of the agreement. And she did agree on the very important role of ownership, political will and leadership um, on, on the two parties, and uh, also talk, discussed with us the uh, I think what, what is a common um, problem for a lot of third parties, which is the exit plan, although um, uh, to a certain extent we saw that CMI continued to be active um, uh, until 2012 uh, through its follow through project. Uh, I, uh, may, perhaps a little bit more on the findings uh, 10, 10 years after or 12 years after the agreement can further enlighten us and as to how we have moved uh, today uh, to, uh, in the afterwards, you know, like uh, another six years later. So maybe you can tell us also a little bit more about that. 
Cheney, on the other hand, talked about the earlier phase, the first phase of the peace negotiations, and precisely pointed to several elements that did not make um, the earlier phase you know, conclusive. Uh, one was precisely the opposite. There was still lack of trust and no political will at the time. Um, and uh, this certainly made it very difficult and uh, created a situation where, in fact, uh, a major war had to happen again before the second phase uh, finally took off. Um, I think all our panelists agree that uh, to a certain extent, a level of success has been achieved, uh, certainly looking back 16 years after. Um, uh, Lisa mentions, the, calls this, uh, says that the situation has normalized and um, what we are seeing in Aceh are similar problems that you see perhaps in all other localities, not only in Indonesia, and certainly in many parts of Southeast Asia as well. Um, and uh, Shenny further elaborated on some of these, what have been achieved in terms of the election and some of the reduction in violence, but certainly a lot of unfinished business yet pertaining to economic re recovery, um, women empowerment, um, si symbolic issues, but very important because it runs deep into the heart of identity-based conflict. And you, you did talk about the, the question of the flag, uh, the symbol that has not been fully uh, you know, allowed uh, to 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 um, to coexist. Um, I do remember that in our process as well, when um, this was one of the hotly contested issue in the draft law, which said that the region, the autonomous region, will have its own flag, emblem, and anthem. And a lot of people really reacted um, vehemently because any symbolic act of some kind of a different identity sort of threatens is threatening to uh, to the majority. Um, and Shelley left us also with some lessons learned um, that we do need to, um, to see these processes as something that is a process. Trans you know, it requires a lot of teamwork, accompaniment, participation, and um, to be able to sustain uh, the gains. So with that, I think we are ready to open the floor for discussion. Um, uh, we do have two questions here uh, in our chat box, but maybe to provide some kind of an overall framework for some of the issues to be discussed. Um, let's see, perhaps some, some of the questions may have something to do with, um, and indeed, you know, I, I received, when I posted the, uh, the announcement for this event on my social media account, I did get um, a long letter from, uh, uh, presumably an Achenese who identified all of the different elements that they feel have not been uh, fully implemented and a lot a lot of these elements have to do with the operation oper operationalization of the relationship between the central government and the uh, 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 autonomous uh, province of uh, province of Aceh. Uh, so we may say that that's the these are the remaining issues with reference to the vertical vertical um, relations between central and and uh, sub sub national and a, uh, a big point uh, there's a reference to a law a national law that was passed in in 2015 called pp number no. three which uh, which according to the person making this comment uh, significantly tied the hands of uh, Ache and further sort of limited its exercise of autonomy uh, not to mention the fact that deviations from the MOU and the LOGA have uh, have significantly reduced some of the independent powers, independent or autonomous powers of uh, the local government. So I think perhaps uh, some more comment on this uh, from uh, from Dr. Rizal Sukma and maybe from our other um, other panelists on the operational uh, on the kind of a vertical relationship unfinished business in really enhancing the vertical relationship between uh, the subnational and the national. On the other hand, we still have the issues of the horizontal conflict. And I think uh, some of these have to do with uh, the kinds of um, uh, segmentation that have occurred after, especially with reference to the GAM, but also still, of course, the cleavages that are found within uh, within the society itself, the issue of women and Sharia law and how to best implement Islam. And of course, the 
economic reintegration and to that and, and we do have a question particularly on this from an anonymous attendee asking about what they feel has not been implemented particularly the compensation uh, for women who have been widowed uh, who lost their husbands during the conflict and uh, and basically an expression of that kind of uh, 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 this need express you know a need to really be able to uh, be able to reintegrate in the uh, in society and enjoy the peace dividends that they have fought for and achieved through the peace agreement so further comments on this point from our uh, panelists um, we'd be happy to hear your comments of uh, further qualifications or um, maybe um, further elaboration on both these uh, these uh, items the and also uh, perhaps in specific specifically to respond to the question that we have on in the q and a box uh, who would like to start can i can i start yes please well thank you uh, i will i will respond to a number of points raised you know in the q and a uh, box uh, what are the indicators that I use, you know, to arrive at the conclusion that I'm quite convinced that, you know, this uh, peace process will continue and then, you know, in the for foreseeable future, we'll not see any uh, resurgence, you know, of this uh, uh, armed uh, demand for independence in, in Nature. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's, I, I can just, you know, use one indicator, which is you look at the grievances that have been you know, raised by, you know, uh, Aceh before the peace accord. But in fact, you know, when, when you look at those grievances, of course, number one is there's always these uh, questions of identity, like, you know, Professor Miriam just mentioned. And this question of identity, you know, I think, you know, has been addressed, you know, in the Loga and also in the MOU about the song, about the, you know, the, the, the flag, even though until today, I think even the Achenese themselves have not agreed yet, you know, which, flag that they need to, you know, to use, you know, but the Indonesian, for the Indonesian government, I think they agree that Aceh can have, you know, its own flag, like any other provinces, you know, in Indonesia, as long as it is not the flag that symbolizes the demand for, you know, in, in, in independence. And then second, they also, I think, uh, there was also a problem of economic injustice. This is the second, I think, top uh, uh, grievance that, you know, Ajani's uh, raised uh, before the MOU uh, in Helsinki. And this, I think, has been addressed, you know, in the LOGA, especially in terms of the financial arrangements, and also in terms of how, you know, the natural resources will be divided, and and and, and so on. Uh, and third, you know, the question of political participation. And actually, I think it's still the only province where uh, local political parties, you know, are a lot, you know, and 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 in fact, now these local political parties, you know, have been uh, uh, able to uh, uh, participate, you know, in the. A local election in the election of the governors, you know, and, and so on. And then the fourth grievance, this is, I think, is still uh, an issue until today uh, on the human rights, past human rights you know, violation. So, in fact, uh, even though at that time, uh, I think uh, there were a number of cases where the central government in Jakarta agreed, you know, to, to really address, but until today, uh, we haven't seen any, any movement, you know, in that, you know, in that you know, direction uh, yet. So, these are few uh, indicators that I think uh, why, you know, I'm quite confident that this uh, 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 peace process of peace in Aceh will continue to be the defining, you know, characteristic of, of that province. The second point, before the Helsinki problem, Aceh is Indonesia's problem. But after the peace process, all Indonesia's problem, now you have it in Aceh. So it's basically, this is what I call the normalization of Aceh within the Unitary Republic of Indonesia. All the challenges that they face, also faced by many other uh, provinces. The questions of you know, inequality, the ability of the central government to deliver economic prosperity, these are still also faced by many other provinces. So it's no longer unique you know, to, you know, to Aceh. And within that context, I think it's quite, you're quite right that the relationship between central government and local government at the provincial level is still work in progress, not only between Jakarta and uh, Aceh, but also between uh, a central government in Jakarta with other provinces, you know, across uh, Indonesia. So I think, you know, we're still working on that. 
because the decentralization process, of course, you know, is not set in stone. So I think uh, uh, there must be some kind of evaluation uh, 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 later on. So that's you know, we can make it you know more uh, uh, perfect. On the second questions in the also Q and A box, uh, let me make it very clear. I'm not the government you know representative here. I'm not a government official, so I cannot promise you that you know we will. Uh, be able to solve the problem that is raised in the uh, Q&A uh, box. But of course, at the early years, you know, especially during the implementation of the DDR program, uh, especially on the program of the reintegration, which of course, you know, consisted of at least two parts, if I'm not mistaken. One is the reintegration fund, and then second on the land distributions, right? Uh, I, I think, Mina, you know, you can expand a little on that one. So I think the UNICEF government already also work with the World Bank at the time. So they work through the Kecamatan Development Bank and Development Program, you know, to actually uh, distribute the reintegration fund to the former combatant. If there are, of course, you know, those people who have not really received yet, so I would call that, you know, probably, you know, a hiccup that needs to be addressed at the local level. But of course, you know, uh, since this uh, 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 corruption issue is still there, you know, because the person basically said that, you know, she already gave the names to the, the to the head of the village, but she didn't get you know any compensation. But that you know, I think uh, uh, also uh, you can find that kind of problem in any other uh, social assistance that the government want to allocate to the the, the people, even during this you know uh, uh, pandemic uh, case you know in in, in many uh, 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 villages you know in in Indonesia. So whether the central government can address those issue. I would say that you know it must be addressed at the local level by the Aceh you know, government themselves because I don't think that the central government want to intervene in those kind of you know problems that uh, some Acehese some uh, former combatant you know still still face you know because uh, this you know should re really be the responsibility of the local government you know, especially in terms of the all the autonomy that they already uh, receive so that's probably uh, uh, my uh, uh, respond to the uh, uh, questions on the indications and also on uh, the questions of compensation that some have not, you know, received. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Issa. Uh, Shani, would you like to respond? Yeah. So on the um, advocacy of transition justice, HG uh, is not in the capacity of. It's not our role to do that, but because we involved in Aceh, what we can, what we always do is whenever we met with the uh, the organization that like Comrades Ham, Indonesian Civil Society, or Aceh Civil Society, or any other organization that on the transition justice, we always encourage them to advocate for that issue. That's so we always push for them to uh, bring it up the subject whenever we met with them. But it's not our capacity of doing the advocacy on the. Francis' justice. I think that's have to make it clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what our involvement. We don't really involve directly on the advocacy, but we only can be able to help encourage others to keep pushing for that, such as like Amazon and others. Right. This is, I'm looking for the question now there was that what the just to frame uh just to locate your answer um this this was a question for you right but it doesn't seem to be here now but yeah so thank you in any case for that, three, uh, yeah it's here <laughs> all right <laughs> On the isn't this question number three question number three uh do you mind reading it i think yeah so, oh, it's gone. Oh, this it's one. Gone, yes. <laughs> uh, Shani, for, for a formal institution for transition justice require legislation from the national government, such as a human rights commission that will lead to transition justice advocacy, as you mentioned. To what extent is HD Center involved in advocating a lobby for transition justice, yeah. uh, a human rights institution that will directly deal with the legitimacy of the conflict? Right. So, so we are not not involved directly, but yeah, we are always, we always encourage people who involved in the transition justice to push forward when we are having discussion with them. 
but that is the case that it does require national le legislation to put it in place or is it something that yeah. can be done at the level of the province you know this is somewhat similar yeah, to there our, is a case of uh, uh, is somewhat similar to the issues now in the Bangsamoro, where we do have provisions yep. for a transitional justice reconciliation, but it's a body that should be created but at a national level, not necessarily through national legislation, but through an executive, uh, you know, uh, executive act, it can be done. Yep. Or if indeed it could be done at the level of the region. But are you saying that, uh, well, just to clarify now, in the case of Indonesia, it's something that has to be done at the national uh, legislature? No, I think both. Both? Uh -huh. both? Both. From the bottom up as well, to push it forward for that. Because I think if you only work on the national, it's not going to be affected as you have to work both from the national and local level to push for that. Okay. Nina, do you have something to say so far from uh, uh, the last uh, discussions? <laughs> Thank you. It has been a rich discussion and many questions. And I think uh, you raised the issue <laughs> previously on how how the follow-up project looked, uh, the CMI follow-up process looked at the the unimplemented uh, issues. And I, I uh, maybe suffice to say, I, I won't go into the de technical details of those, but I, I, I already back into just 2020, uh, 12, sorry, 2012, uh, the estimate was that the so, so to say the process of the MOU implementation has to uh, in a way quite large extent uh, passed into the process of implementation of the law lo the law governance of Aceh and I think that is the continuous process so uh, in a way the peace agreement has been <laughs> taken over by the law and and there of course at least at the time now I must say I'm not uh, so up to date on on the latest developments but had, were discrepancies between the peace agreement and the implementing law so to say and of course uh, many of the issues uh, that are being raised I think continuously by by especially the the archer side uh, have to deal have to uh, dealing with the issue of, of also maybe the loga, the law governance of Aceh not uh, perhaps always uh, given the weight or, or considered, being considered to the extent possible uh, or to the extent it should be also when acting uh, national law, so to say. So I think there are uh, something to, to be learned from this, at least <laughs> back in the day. Uh, but also, uh, I think from the Archer side uh, and what we were trying to promote uh, during that short process was to have this dialogue mechanism between the central government and the, the local government in Archer uh, to, to negotiate and, and to find a common solution to the issues that are were contested or there was a disagreement upon or that had not been implemented. Uh, and I'm sorry to say, I don't know exactly how that work has progressed and whether that kind of um, understanding of the Aceh uh, special autonomy is still there. And I'm sure it is uh, in, in the central government as well. But uh, in the early days, there was an Aceh desk uh, committed to the issues of Aceh. And I understand that the development is, is as, as uh, uh, was said by by uh, the the first speaker that uh, Aceh in a way has become more a province among others. So the the issues have become more the same as with the others, and that of course uh, is is in a way good development. But also that this Aceh special autonomy uh, status uh, for the Achenese themselves and the province uh, and those interests are being. So to say, duly taken into consideration also on the central government level, and I think there the discussion between the parties was the key that we identified in terms of trying to solve and and hopefully also implement the the, the issues that were still open. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mina. And uh, on that last point that you were making, we do have some sentiments expressed here on the website, um, uh, I mean, in the question, in the chat box, um, 
to advance Aceh, I believe the province under autonomy should be granted more economic autonomy by the government. This could attract more foreign investments. At the current state, it's more like the central government has a firm grip on Aceh, which limits further development. It places well uh, in place where those resources were natural resources, people brain power, skills, and knowledge. I believe through economic opportunities and freedom to grow, Aceh could integrate more efficiently to the neighboring provinces. Um, if that kind of uh, greater autonomy is made possible. And uh, on, uh, on the other hand, we have a related uh, comment on, on that point by Mahmoudi Yusbi from the ASEAN Foundations, uh, saying, Foundation saying that since the MOU 20 years ago, the peace process has resulted in a safe condition for its people to return to their everyday life, people go to their coffee shop, they can instantly feel the peace process going on. However, I believe Aceh's government is now a uh, lullaby by the ongoing peace in Aceh. With the special autonomy given by the central government to Aceh, it does not seem to benefit the people or particularly the ex-member of the GAM and conflict victims. Aceh has become the poorest province in Indonesia. What do you suggest? to better off the situation. It looks like government of Aceh does not have solid capacity to benefit and the special autonomy does not give a good life. So on the one hand, you have this issue of what the central government is not yet really giving to Aceh in terms of real powers. But on the other hand, there is this um, perception or impression that uh, the Aceh gover Achenese government itself continues to be uh, under uh, achieving in terms of what it should deliver to their own local people. Uh, where, where do you stand on this uh, two different perspectives? Perhaps we could ask our analyst uh, on that. And of course, we take note of a comment by Krishna here that it would have been better if we had somebody from uh, the local government of Aceh to be here and uh, also to um, present their uh, their views and cite their views. Although again, of course, we know that Aceh would have different perspectives. The people of Aceh would have different perspectives as well. But let's ask our panelists: Where do you where do you see yourselves in these two sort of um, polar positions? would like to start? Well, well okay. Uh, I don't understand what else that, you know, central government can give to Aceh. You know, almost they gave almost everything except independence. Uh, so, you know, if you want to, be, you know, make, I mean, if you want all that needs to benefit, then, you know, of course the central government, you know, has to do it right, has to pursue, you know, uh, good, good policies. And in this context, there are only three, you know, sectors that they need to focus on in order to deliver you know, all their promises to the Achenese. Number one, focus on education. Second, focus on health. So when you get sick, you don't have to fly to Penang. You don't have to fly to Medan. You don't have to fly to Jakarta. You can get cured, you know, in, in, in Aceh province itself. The third one, investment. You might want to ask yourself, why no investment coming to Aceh? So in that context, what is the best way to deal with this problem? We are now in a democracy. Aceh now is also in democracy. Then, you know, please choose your representative and your government wisely, you know, so you do not just choose anybody, you know, to do the government work for you. So in the next election, if you think the current government is not good enough, no capability, you know, to deliver economic development, don't choose them anymore. Choose somebody else, choose other parties. So that's how it works that how it should be in any democracy. So that's, I think, the key, uh, I think, you know, a perspective that we need to really uh, think over, you know, in order to move, you know, the process forward, you know, to really deliver what has been promised by peace process in Inache to all Achenese. Right. Thank you, Risa, uh, Shani, or Mina, would you like to? Yep. So I think I agree with Parizal because this issue only in Aceh. In other provinces, also the same. Like sometimes we choose our political party, we choose our governor, our uh, candidate for government, and the, the promise is not being delivered. What happened in Aceh, if compared to before the 
the peace process. As he, this person, uh, Mohammed, used to be saying, you can't go out relax. Now, when I go back to Aceh, I feel like I'm not in Aceh. I'm in some other city that is so peaceful, um, things moving. Yes, there is a hiccup through the way, but I think this is why the civil society play, play a big role to push for the political party or the governor to uh, make a change. And, you know, there is a parliament, a local parliament that you're using to voice their representative for you guys, to push it through for make it a better situation for Aceh. So we can't just blaming all the time the central government as well. Aceh government, local government have been given a lot of opportunity to running their own governor. That's this, the benefit from that compared to the other region. I think this is we have to use wisely and how to improve it. That's from me. Thank you. All right, Nina. Mm, thank you. Um, yes, <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I concur with the previous speaker in terms of uh, um, on, on how I, I think there is a fair level, I, I think it's safe to say, a fair level of funds that have been allocated to Aceh, both uh, through the special autonomy funds, uh, but also otherwise. But I, I, I think what we, and coming back again <laughs> to the assessment that we made back in 2012, and apologies for not uh, being so well uh, aware of the situation currently, but already back in the day, uh, we thought that uh, what would be needed is a comprehensive for the Aceh really province, the sustainable economic development strategy. To, to guide the utilization of funds. And uh, I think uh, allocations to district and municipality level and then giving them, <clears throat> excuse me, a stronger role in managing the, the, the funds in order to strengthen accountability and, and really increase uh, the benefits for the local population. But of course, this is a long process and it, it's, uh, you know, still 16 years is, is a short time and, and to build that capacity and, and to, to have that kind of a functioning uh, system is not achieved overnight, but I, I think a lot could be done on, on, on the effectiveness and, and uh, allocations. Thanks. Um, I heard from a specialist on uh, federalism say that you have to be careful what you ask for. And he, he was referring to, you know, these kinds of uh, armed conflicts where you are trying to refashion the relationship between the central and the subnational government. And there is that kind of desire really to have a full range of powers. Uh, but in any case, looking at the case of Aceh, um, you did point, all three of you sort of con concur that what's there is something to work on and it's something to fully realize and deliver the, more, the most important elements that will affect the lives of the people education, health, economic, um, economic development, and all that. But at the same time, it's also true that there are deviations between, from the, between the LOGA, the law governing Aceh, as well as what has been agreed upon in the MOU. So we do know, we, well, it's a fact that the MOU has been signed and it doesn't really have to go the, by way of the Colombian example where they, they had to modify elements of the peace agreement after losing the referendum. But the MOU stays, but you can modify the law. So just looking back now uh, and looking also at some of the issues that are being raised um, uh, by uh, some of the uh, those who are more critical about uh, the outcome, uh, is are there elements in the law that you feel can still be uh, amended or adjusted in order to um, really create the better conditions for uh, achieving uh, these core goals of so a better life and uh, a better government for, for Aceh. Uh, well, well, of course, you know, there are always room for, for improvement. But, you know, I think that, you know, you know, fall into the category of the problem, what I call post peace agreement problems, right? So, you know, I think we need the entire session for that. But now it's, what is important is that I think we take the lessons why we as a civilized nation managed to put a stop to the killing, to the armed conflict in Aceh. While on the other hand, 
the same problem is still continuing in Myanmar. So as an ASEAN institution, you know, the IPR should learn from the process in Aceh, you know, what can be learned. So in order, you know, to make it possible for ASEAN to really, you know, help Myanmar, for example. So that I think at the moment is really two different, you know, uh, uh, issue. Uh, so for the post peace agreement, there are always problems that, you know, some people would say that, well, it's not enough freedom. Some people say, well, you have too much, you know, so that's, that's another, you know, category of a problem that, that we face. And in fact, not only Aceh, the entire Indonesia face the problem of how the central government, you know, relate to the uh, local, local government. Uh, but, you know, here, you know, I think it would be great, you know, if we can also use this experience to stop the killing, to stop the use of force to resolve, you know, in, in order to resolve a problem in Aceh and then try, you know, to look at whether the same thing can also be done in other part of, you know, Southeast Asia. Okay. Nina or Shani, would you like to add anything to this? No? Shani? I don't think it's to changing the, 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 the a law or something like that, but I think to improve, you have to do, I think there is, a, as you have to another discussion on how to make sure that the regulation or the things is working. So it's not the changing, but actually to assess and to, to find way on how to make it work. Because what you have now is very comprehensive and how to make it work implementation is another question. Mm -hmm. Right. True. Uh, implementation is more difficult than the actual negotiation, you may say. I mean, many people have uh, said that who have been through these processes. Mina, would you like to add to this? So uh, we still have some questions from uh, on specifically on the role of CMI, uh, uh, which you can address afterwards, unless you have uh, unless you want to add a little bit first on this discussion point. Uh, sorry, there's some uh, connectivity issue, so I'm not quite sure <laughs> uh, what the issue was. You'd like me to comment beyond the just the on the question of uh, the LOGA and the MOU uh, in terms of uh, really uh, uh, furthering this implementation process. Just on that point. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, then I, I would like to maybe emphasize my previous point on, on the conclusion that we came to that there are, of course, deviations. Uh, um, between the at, at least in 2012 still were and I, I believe they're still there uh, between the MOU and the LOGA and there are issues that are not covered by the LOGA but but uh, um, it's uh, maybe at this point I could um, uh, note that there is a study that we made with the conclusions that is is the the Aceh peace process follow-up project final report where we have actually a table of of these issues so I would not uh, perhaps here like to go into the, the, the details, but, but indeed what we said would be important uh, to address the, those concerns is, is the continuous uh, discussion between the local and the central government in terms of implementing, or if it's a question of, uh, so to say, revising the, the LOGA, the law governance structure, then it is a, a um, um, law drafting process, uh, which uh, is a technical exercise in a way. And I think some of those issues could be covered there, but I think that the, the bigger question is the political um, differences or, or differences of views. And, and there, I think, and as a peace mediation organization, I, uh, we came to the conclusion that, uh, that the discussion, the focus group discussions that were established as, as, a, as part of that process would, would continue uh, to allow for the effective um, and, so to say, also mm, um, combined uh, view to, to voice also the Aceh uh, viewpoints uh, towards the central government, so they would not be uh, all these different voices, but Aceh would also be able to, to the extent possible, speak to uh, one, one voice and, and through the government also. Thank you. Miriam, can I just add, Prof, can I just add something? Mm -hmm. I think on the logo itself, uh, as 
some of them was happy with Logger, but I think one of the main issue was about the women empowerment. And this is, was uh, lack of that because of the Sharia law. Some believe the Sharia law was forced to be included in the Logga because just to get the sign off. So I think this is one of the things that has to be looked into it. But um, is, that, is that how to how to make it the Sharia law that allow women to be more participate in, in, in Aceh? So I think this that's the thing that I think I want to emphasize more on the role of the woman. Mm -hmm. And Shani, actually on that point, uh, much of the concern uh, in the aftermath of the, uh, the creation of the autonomous province was precisely on some of the, the new legislation that has come out with reference to Sharia and, and, and women. Um, and uh, where are we on this? I understand that some of these have actually been suspended in terms of implementation. Is it the case? Uh, or I'm not sure. Sure, I think dynamic taking place now in uh, in Ache itself, in terms of being able to assert the women's uh, women's role, women's participation, not not only in the political process, certainly also in the economic and social processes. But how is the dynamic now? I think there is to... there is still a lot of discussion on that, but there is not final decision on that. There is a lot of pressure. I think like Sharia Mahaban. Um, uh, and others, women group have been pushing for that, but I, I don't, I don't see the uh, the final document yet, so I can't really comment on that. Okay. Um, now going back to Mina, we have a question here from Raymond and Daya with regard to the role of uh, CMI. Uh, has the CMI's perspective on the impartiality of a med mediator facilitator change over the years based on your experience in assisting in peace processes? How deeply involved is CMI in helping the conflict parties establish a framework for transitional justice? Uh, thank you for this uh, question. Um, uh, uh, let us say, has the CMI perspective on the impartiality of a mediator changed over the years? Um, uh, no, <laughs> I, I, I think uh, we as CMI uh, still believe in the, the um, so to say, the impartial third party is, is, is a key. However, I, I should say in this context, uh, a word from President Ahtisari, I, I remember him saying always that uh, there's no such thing as an impartial person. Of course, the mediator all, always brings to the table certain values and, and uh, viewpoints. Uh, and and uh, maybe the word impartiality is, is not the best one. I think maybe a, 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 a trusted uh, third party or, or so uh, would be perhaps better suited. Uh, impartiality is, is in its maybe hard to, to achieve in, in, in the pure sense of the word. But of course, we still believe, it, and, and that's what the CMI is based on, uh, is, is the fact that the third party uh, is independent and objective uh, towards the, the situation at hand. So uh, of course, uh, I think it should be mentioned that the uh, um, peace process or mediation or negotiation process like the one uh, in Aceh is something that, that uh, is a rare <laughs> occasion in a way where there would be two parties uh, negotiating and with one mediator leading to a, a final uh, agreement. And uh, more the work that we do these days is, is being supportive of process or, or uh, facilitating different tracks. But I, I think the, the principle still uh, remains that we are independent uh, and neutral uh, party. Uh, to the processes that we are involved in. Uh, how deeply is CMI then helping conflict parties to establish a framework for transitional justice? Um, I myself have not uh, been in any process where this has been uh, really on the forefront of the agenda, but of course uh, in the conflict resolution uh, process widely, uh, we engage with actors and, and take support from actors who are expert in a, in a given um, uh, area or thematic question. Uh, but this is not 
transitional justice per se is not an expert area of CMIs, but but in in many of course processes this is very critical question. Uh, but but there are also other actors who are specialists, uh, and and to whom we also uh, lean towards. Then in case of uh, there would be an issue uh, or or a question where that kind of support would be needed. Mm -hmm. All right. I think uh, uh, with that last question on the third party mediator, we're, we're closing our open discussion. Um, Miriam? Unless, yes. Doc. Can I just, very short, oh, yeah, I sure. need to address the questions by Tommy. Uh, mm -hmm. He is asking whether there is a system in place in Aceh that, you know, keep corrupt officials by the central government in, in Aceh. So, you know, I think there is no such system. Because you know, in Indonesia, the governor directly elected by the people concerned, and then the local parliaments directly elected, head of district directly elected by the people as well, and then the local government has the right to appoint you know the head of government agencies in that particular province, autonomy or no, no autonomy. So that's you know I think all in the hands of the local uh, government. So there is no system where the central government try to keep corrupt officials in a particular province so that that province will continue to be poor. So there is no such system. We are real democracy. Even the head of a district elected directly by the people, not through no other, other system. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Risa. I thought that you were not particularly interested in going back to these issues, but it's great that you did manage to answer Tommy again on, his, on uh, the last point that he had raised. Um, uh, with this, uh, uh, Shani, unless you want to say something before we close, uh, you're done on transitional justice because you probably HD has something has been doing more on this. Uh, not really on transitional justice, but I think I just want to say that every peace process is a, a process, is long process. So I think everybody need to be patient on then how progress and then support the, your local government as much as you possible to make it they're doing their the, the work. Uh, implementing on their program. So it's not going to be end until today. It will be continue and you have to support. And I think uh, central government also have to uh, be more, uh, what they call, uh, proactive on communicating with the local government and trying to address the issue that they raise. Mm. So, yes, so it's certainly a lot of uh, unfinished business, but a lot has been achieved and there's no reason to go back. There's a lot of reason to really move forward and really um, uh, feel the peace dividends. Uh, we're ready to close our discussion. And um, I would like to use this occasion to uh, this segment to thank our panelists for, uh, for uh, their presentations, their thoughts, uh, their analysis that have greatly informed us on uh, on uh, what has transpired and what still continue to be part of the challenges as well as uh, the gains of the Aceh peace process. And thank you also to our participants. I think um, it will be great to hear at this point uh, some remarks from our uh, executive director, the executive director of the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, uh, Ambassador uh, Gusti Agung uh, Wesaka. Pudja, um, please, um, may we ask you to sort of help us wrap up this discussion? Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Professor, for this opportunity. Uh, this is really um, a very uh, stimulating and, and, and uh, thought-provoking uh, discussion um, indeed, I hope. This will be uh, very uh, useful to everybody in terms of the uh, lesson learned. Of course, uh, the focus of this uh, discussion is on the uh, mediation uh, perspective, uh, basically, uh, which gives uh, us a reflection and how to, to move um, uh, forward, uh, in, in particular, uh, in the uh, implementation after the, the signing. You, you are very uh, much uh, correct. That, the peace agreement is not about uh, signing uh, MOU, but the most important is the how the um, implementation and how to uh, nurture a peace after the uh, signing of the um, agreement. Well, well of course, uh, in the peace agreement, 
no one size fits all. So it depends on the um, uh, uh, circumstances and the situations. Um, each conflict has its own um, uh, processes, which is um, uh, very, very uh, unique um, um, indeed. So um, there is no instance conflict resolutions, and certainly there is no instance um, in the um, implementations. So it takes a, a process, um, um, a building blocks of process. Uh, so every a party should, should be uh, patient um, on this. So, um, of course, in any part of the world, uh, there is no such a, a perfect uh, agreement because agreements based on um, a mutual uh, take and give, based on a compromise. So, um, at least in this uh, respect with regard to Aceh, we learned that uh, no military solutions could bring the peace uh, solutions um, in this respect. So, as um, uh, Dr. Rizal said, there, there, there needs a strong political will uh, to make peace um, in the part of the um, uh, leadership. So, suddenly, peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the ability to handle conflict by peaceful uh, means. So in terms of the mediators, um, of course, they should be trusted, credible, and knowledgeable. I believe both of you, uh, representative from the CMI and also from the Henry Dunan Center, the Human Rights um, Dialogue uh, Center, uh, uh, met this um, um, uh, criteria. Um, it depends on, on the stages, um, indeed. Um, of course, the uh, peace process could be up and down, but should never be exhausted. And I believe, uh, um, as you mentioned, uh, the, this, the, the, the track should be uh, continued after the, the, the signing of the um, MOU. So finally, in nurturing peace, we need a creative and innovative way, especially in this democratic life. You cannot discover new oceans unless you have the courage to lose sight of the soul. I thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador. Now I turn over the floor to our organizers. Uh, please, uh, uh, next part, Kartika. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you, Professor Miriam, uh, for moderating this afternoon's discussion. Thank you as well to all the three speakers for their time, for uh, sharing their experience, their expertise, and also in answering some of the tough questions posed by the audience. Uh, before we close, as in ASEAN tradition, we would like to request for a group photo. This will involve the moderator, the speakers, and the executive director of the ASEAN IPR. The secretariat will assist in taking the pictures. Um, so I will count down in three, two, one, once more, please. In three, two, one. Thank you very much. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the third session of the ASEAN IPR discussion series 2021. We hope you have found the discussion interesting and useful. We apologize for the technical inconveniences during the discussion and that we were not able to answer all the questions posed we express our sincere appreciation to all attendees in Zoom and viewers on YouTube who have followed the discussion from beginning to end. You can review the discussion on our ASEAN IPR's YouTube channel. And lastly, we would also like to express gratitude and appreciation to the Embassy of Ireland and the Embassy of Finland in Jakarta for their generous support towards the ASEAN IPR discussion series 2021. We hope you will be able to join our next discussion series session in the meantime, we hope you stay safe and healthy. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much everybody. Thank you. Terima Thank, kasih, you. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Masini and Ms. Mina. All the best. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Prof.
Thank you, Kartika. Thank you, Ms. Shani. Thank you, Ms. Bina. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor. Bye.